China's Ray Earth move did more than rattle defense firms. It sent a warning straight to Boeing and Airbus. Because the hidden metals inside almost every jet they build can be slowed, priced up, or blocked by one decision in Beijing. And that has never happened to the scale like it just did before. But here's the question that keeps coming up. If the aircraft world has backup suppliers, why did one policy from China cause this much trouble? And what did China target that gives it so much influence over two of the biggest names in aviation? In all these years, Boeing and Airbus have presented their supply chains as global, stable, and flexible enough to withstand almost any disruption. Engine delays, labor issues, and sudden cost spikes were treated as routine challenges. But hidden behind this confidence was a weak spot that rarely entered public discussion. Both aircraft makers depend on a set of metals that sit deep inside their jets, almost never mentioned in earnings calls or production updates. These metals come from a chain that China dominates from the ground up, and when China started tightening its rules, that quiet dependency became a real source of uncertainty. The problem begins with control. China has the lead in rare ores at nearly every stage. It mines most of the ore, processes almost all of the high-grade material, and produces the magnets that aircraft rely on for sensors, actuators, radar parts, and other core systems. These are not large components. They are small but essential pieces that must withstand heat, vibration, and constant stress. Without the right magnets, aircraft systems cannot move, sense, or communicate with accuracy. What makes this so important is the nature of rare earth processing. Mining is not the issue. Many countries have rare earth deposits. But getting these metals to the purity and performance levels required for aircraft takes a long chain of chemical steps that China has spent decades refining. That means Boeing and Airbus do not depend on the ore itself. They depend on the processing. And almost all of that processing happens in China. This dependence stayed in the background until China introduced strict export license rules. The licenses changed the math. Parts that once moved freely through global supply lines now needed approval. A magnet order that used to be routine could suddenly face delays. A small postponement in one shipment could slow work across dozens of suppliers. This was not a complete shutdown. China did not ban the metals. It did something more subtle. It controlled the pace. And pace is everything in aviation. An aircraft line cannot move if key parts do not arrive on time. This is why the industry reacted fast. It was the first sign that China could influence aircraft timelines through a single section of the supply chain. To understand why Boeing and Airbus are now exposed, you have to look at how China built its rare earth position over time. None of this happened suddenly. It developed through choices made over many years, while other regions assumed these metals would always be easy to source from open markets. The first big warning came in 2010, when China briefly restricted rare earth exports to Japan after a maritime dispute. That single move shocked governments and industries because it showed how much influence China already had over something the world barely paid attention to. It also revealed how dependent high-tech sectors had quietly become on materials processed in China. Even then, China was already moving toward dominance across mining, separation, and magnet manufacturing. During the 2010s and early 2020s, China continued to tighten its grip. It closed illegal mines, merged state firms, and modernized huge refining plots. By the time Boeing and Airbus were scaling up new aircraft programs, China controlled most of the world's rare earth mining and nearly all of the processing. Even when the ore was pulled from the ground in places like Australia or the United States, it often had to be shipped to China for the chemical steps required to tain it into usable material. Processing is where the real value is, and China built its lead there, not by accident but through long-term industrial planning. The next major shift came on December 21, 2023. China banned the export of the technology used to separate and refine rare earths. This meant other countries could mine the ore, but they could not easily build plants that match China's quality or volume. The chemical steps involved are extremely complex, and China's knowledge in this area is the product of decades of research and investment. By blocking the technology itself, China made sure no quick alternative could appear outside its borders. In 2024, China sent another clear signal by restricting other strategic minerals, including gallium and germanium. These moves were responses to Western ship controls, but they also showed that China was willing to use material supply as a form of pressure. Then came early April 2025. The United States raised tariffs on Chinese goods. China responded with its own tariffs, but added something far more consequential. It introduced strict export licenses on seven heavy ray earths, including metals that aircraft systems rely on for heat resistance and stability. For Boeing and Airbus, 
This was the point where a quiet dependency turned into a measurable risk. The reason this matters so much is that Boeing and Airbus depend on magnets and alloys that cannot be swapped without major redesigns. These materials shape how aircraft handle heat, force, and long-term stress. And they rely on metals that China either mines, processes, or controls through licenses. Dysprosium and terbium are added to new dimium magnets to help them hold strength at high temperatures. Without them, magnets weaken fast. This affects actuators that move flaps and rudders, sensors near engines, and electronics exposed to heat. Samarium is important as well. Samarium cobalt magnets survive even higher temperatures and appear in radar parts, guidance systems, and engine zone components. These magnets are not optional. They are built into the safety and reliability of the aircraft. The bottleneck is in the separation and refining stage, where China holds almost all global capacity. Processing rare earths requires long lines of chemical steps. These steps produce the purity needed for aviation systems. By banning processing technology exports in 2023, China ensured that other countries could not easily catch up. So even when the ore comes from Australia or the United States, the refining often happens in China. That means Boeing and Airbus depend not just on the raw metals, but on China's approval to move the process material. When licenses became mandatory in 2025, that approval became a point of control. China does not need a full ban to create pressure. It only needs to influence timing. And timing is what keeps aircraft production alive. The first clear signs of disruption came outside aviation. Automakers in Europe and Japan reported delays because they could not get enough high-grade magnets. The connection to aircraft parts was immediate. If car production slowed, aircraft suppliers could face even tighter constraints because their parts require higher precision and longer testing cycles. Then came October 2025. China expanded the rules through two new announcements. The first added five more rare earth metals used in optics, lasers, and sensors. These systems appear in both civilian aircraft and defense platforms. The second announcement introduced something far more complex. It applied the rules beyond China's borders. If any product made in another country used Chinese processed material at any stage, it still required approval. Even a small fraction of Chinese content could trigger oversight. This change hit aviation hard. Aircraft components come from long chains of suppliers. If one supplier anywhere in the chain used Chinese processed material, the entire part could fall under license rules. Then came the sharpest turn. Beginning December 1, 2025, China stated that companies linked to foreign militaries would face near-automatic license denial. Any request tied to military use would be rejected. Many aviation suppliers produce for both commercial and defense aircraft. One flag supplier could affect multiple lines. This did not shut down the industry, but it exposed something more important. Access was no longer secure. Supply could slow without warning, and a slow chain can be just as damaging as a broken one. As the new license rules settled in, companies across the world started to grasp the scale of disruption. Public statements were measured, but private reports painted a very different picture. Suppliers in Europe, Japan, and the United States all faced longer lead times, sudden paperwork demands, and uncertainty around when or if their shipments would be cleared. This uncertainty spread fast because aircraft systems depend on precision parts with almost no room for delay. Think tanks and energy agencies raised warnings early. Analysts at CIS noted that the heavy rare earths targeted by China were the exact metals used in high-temperature magnets for aircraft actuators and avionics. The IEA warned that the April and October 2025 rules increased price swings and exposed how little backup capacity existed outside China. These reports were not focused on aircraft alone, yet the aviation implications were clear. Boeing and Airbus could not swap materials and their suppliers could not produce components without predictable access to the metals that gave their magnets heat stability. Europe started to feel strain as well. The European Parliament called attention to the issue in July 2025, pointing out that the April controls had already slowed production in sectors tied to energy and defense. Aircraft suppliers were not always named directly, but many used the same rare earth inputs. In some regions, manufacturers had to reduce output simply because they could not secure enough magnet material in time. Meanwhile, the United States reviewed its own exposure. Reports highlighted that even when raw ore came from American mines, it was often sent to China for refinement before returning as finished material. This created a loop that was hard to break. It also raised an uncomfortable point. Long before tensions intensified, China had already positioned itself at the center of the supply chain. By the time license rules kicked in, rerouting production was no longer simple. 
Inside Boeing and Airbus, the tone became cautious. Neither company wanted to alarm customers, but suppliers reported rising magnet prices, new order limits, and growing fear that even a short delay in China could ripple through months of production. Aircraft assembly lines run on tight schedules. A missing magnet or actuator part can halt progress on entire sections of a jet. This was the moment when industry leaders realized that the challenge was not theoretical. It was already here, and it was affecting the foundation of modern aircraft manufacturing. While the aviation world focused on delays, licenses, and supply risks, another part of the story was unfolding far from Boeing's factories in the United States and Airbus sites in Europe. The Ray Earth chain that powers aircraft systems comes with a human and environmental cost that rarely reaches public view. Most of the world's rare earth processing takes place in two regions of China, Baoqiu and Bayanobo in Inner Mongolia. These areas form the heart of China's refining industry, and they reveal the hidden side of the clean technologies used in aircraft, cars, and electronics. Studies from recent years describe large tailings ponds, including the Baogang Tailings Dam, which holds tens of millions of cubic meters of waste from rare earth processing. The waste often contains heavy metals and radioactive material. Research has shown high levels of thorium and other contaminants in soil and water near processing sites. These findings match reports from local residents who have raised concerns about health problems such as respiratory issues, cancer cases, and birth defects. These are the communities living with the cost of producing the metals needed for modern aircraft. This gives an important layer of context to China's decision to tighten control. Official statements from Chinese authorities often mention national security and the need to limit illegal transfers of sensitive materials. But they also point to environmental protection and the risks that come with unregulated refining. Greater control can reduce some pollution, but it also strengthens China's strategic position. The same rules that restrict harmful practices can shape global supply chains. The impact is not limited to China, as Europe, the United States, Australia, and India explore new mining and refining projects, they face resistance from local communities. Many people fear that the environmental problems seen in Inner Mongolia could appear in their own regions. Water use, land disturbance, and the risk of toxic waste storage have become major points of debate in countries trying to reduce dependence on Chinese processing. This leaves aircraft manufacturers in a difficult position. The magnets and alloys they depend on come from processes that many countries are hesitant to host, but also from a supply chain that is now under tighter control. The environmental burden explains why alternatives are slow to develop, and why China's rare earth leverage remains strong even as global demand grows. By late 2025, one question hovered over the entire aviation world. Could Boeing and Airbus break free from this supply chain? Or had the rare earth system become too ingrained to replace? Governments rushed to announce new mines, magnet plants, and pilot refining projects. The United States backed separation facilities in California and Texas. Europe explored magnet factories in Germany and Estonia. Australia, India, and Japan all pushed their own plans to build parallel chains. But the same problem appeared everywhere. These projects could take years to finish. Even with ore available, the missing part was the refinement skill that China had spent decades building. Processing rare earths at scale requires precise chemistry, quality control, and years of industrial practice. None of the new sites could match China's capacity in the near term. And while they worked to catch up, aircraft makers still had schedules to meet. This is where the pressure reached its peak. China did not stop exports. It did not block shipments outright. It simply controlled the rhythm of the flow. A single delayed license, a slower review, or change in priority could influence hundreds of parts across aircraft programs. The supply chain did not break, but it no longer moved on its own terms. For Boeing and Airbus, that was the true turning point. Control had shifted from market dynamics to policy decisions. The resolution, at least for now, is uneasy. Western countries will continue to build new capacity, but until it reaches full scale, both aircraft makers remain tied to a chain that runs through China's refining centers. They can diversify sources of oil, but not the processing that turns or into the magnets their systems rely on. If China can influence aircraft production by adjusting rare earth rules, what happens when the next strategic material faces the same kind of oversight? Aircraft builders solved engine problems, software problems, and labor shortages. But none of those compare to a supply chain where one country controls the step that gives the material its value. For now, the question is simple. If this is what China can do with rare earths, what happens when it decides to focus on something even harder to replace?